Welcome to another episode of the Nuclear Medicine and Molecular Medicine podcast, the world's longest running medical podcast. And um, today we've got uh, Michelle James from Stanford. And we'll start by just tell us a little bit about yourself. Where are you from? Sure. So I am actually from Sydney, Australia. That's where I grew up uh, in the Sutherland Shire. So I'm a Shire girl. And I, uh, yeah, I grew up around, around Sydney, uh, went to Sydney University to do all my training. I uh, trained as a radiochemist and uh, did my PhD in pharmacology and radiochemistry. And yeah, that's kind of um, where I started. Well, as anybody who's been watching the podcast knows, I love radiochemists. So the, the most important part of nuclear medicine <laughs> is the chemistry. It just doesn't work without it, right? Right. Right. So... Um, so today um, we, uh, we saw you give a talk um, uh, today at the Australian New Zealand Society of Nuclear Medicine on, uh, on a couple of different things, but I thought one particular thing was um, immune imaging, particularly in the brain. Um, so uh, can you tell us a little bit about what that, that was about? Yes, uh, definitely my passion is uh, immune cells and um, trying to better detect different types of immune cells in um, the context of different brain diseases in particular. So we've been developing a whole toolbox of um, radio traces so that we can detect both innate and adaptive immune cells. I started more on the innate side and we were looking at microglial activation. So that's where I kind of started uh, 15 years ago working on TSPO PET, but we wanted to do something more specific. And that's where we uh, started to develop uh, newer agents for um, innate immune cells. But I also started to get interested in the adaptive immune system. And that's where uh, really what happened was um, I was thinking more about multiple sclerosis. I mentioned today during my talk, one of my friends was diagnosed with MS. Sure living with her at the time. So and that's one of the more common yeah. autoimmune diseases. It affects a huge numbers of the population, yes. particularly women. Yeah. Um, and, um, and finding a way to manage that therapy by, um, by understanding what's happening really inside the brain mm. is key because that therapy is starting to work now. We're starting to get right. things that actually work. But timing of that therapy is important. And we really haven't got any great biomarks to do that. When we do a do an MR scan, even with 7 Tesla, right. you're looking at the damage after it's occurred, not, not while it's occurred. So um, I know they'd love to have traces that look at the immune system. The other thing is every other disease you can think of in the brain, pretty much from cancer to Alzheimer's disease, right. has an inflammatory component to it, right? Exactly. So we, we know that the immune component is very important. Uh, people used to think it was just a sort of more of a byproduct of what was happening. But now we're starting to learn that the immune system is playing a key role in driving the disease in a lot of instances. So we've been working to develop these tools to really pass out the different cell populations and not markers, sort of looking for markers that are not just telling us about whether the cells are present or not, but they're giving us more of an idea about particular subsets or their functional phenotypes. So we've been working to identify those markers. We started with some simple markers, just as I was talking about today, with looking at B cells, we've been targeting CD19 positive B lymphocytes as well as CD20. Uh, on the T cell activation side, we're looking at OX40 and ICLOS, and that was some work started by Sam Gambier's lab. Uh, so really on the, the adaptive side, we're, we're just starting to enter into that arena. Uh, not many people that I know of are looking at the adaptive immune cells in uh, brain diseases. Um, people have been looking at, looking at them in cancer for a while. I think there's a lot of um, power there and um, potential for us to learn about what these cells are doing in brain diseases like MS and like you say, to better you know, optimize the, the treatments that we have that actually are quite good, but it's just we need to understand about the timing, dosing, delivery methods, and which patients will benefit most from which therapies. So. Yeah, well, well Sam gave yeah. you passed away um, um, and was much loved in the whole new telemedicine community. And, and if this, you know, many legacies, but one of them might be, you know, some of this sort of stuff that's, uh, that's helped along those lines. So, 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 so what, what new traces are there that, that you know, that, uh, that, uh, that work or seem to be working? Well, yeah, and it depends on the target that you're, that you're looking at. But I, I do think you know, on the T cell front, there's uh, FRG, which is something that Sam had developed. And there's a, his wife is running a company called Cellside uh, that's focused on that. 
There's um, some of the other T cell activation markers, ICOS, I think is a really promising one. There's a, we have an agent for that. Uh, and on the B cell side, I think the CD19 PET is looking really promising just because we can capture those uh, plasma blasts and plasma cells that we were missing previously. Uh, I think on the innate sort of um, imaging side, we have uh, a particular marker that allows us to delineate your peripheral infiltrating right. cells. That's a TREM1 imaging agent. Uh, and in different contexts, what's interesting with that marker is that in sort of a Parkinson's context, we seem to be detecting neutrophils uh, that are infiltrating the brain. And uh, in, a, in a more of an Alzheimer's or an MS context, we're looking at macrophages and a certain subset of those cells. So I think we're getting uh, better at <laughs> making traces that are more specific for certain types of immune cells, but I think we're just at the very beginning. Right. So we've got some challenges when it comes to making any pet tracer in the brain, um, but particularly ones that target immune cells because it's got to get across the blood-brain barrier. It's got to not have off-target bonding. And it's got to have a significant amount of uptake and it's got to change when the disease changes, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. So, um, so it was interesting that, that you looked at all of those aspects, didn't you, really? Yes, and it's, it, the, you've named all of the major challenges that uh, we face as radiochemists trying to get a molecule into the brain and things, the things that plague us. And it's, even if you think you have it all right, uh, we can get surprised and it's hard to predict whether something will cross the blood right. barrier. Right, because we, when yeah. we test you know, new radiopharmaceuticals, we test them on mouse models, right? That's right. And mouse models aren't always great indications of, uh, you know, of, of things that work in the brain. Um, you know, the greatest and you know, most, one of the most influential ever traces of all time, which is PIB, doesn't work in mice, uh, uh, but, but it works in humans. Right. Now, if that's the case, then have we thrown away a whole lot of really good traces that might have made a big difference in disease mm -hmm. because we thought they didn't work because they didn't work in mice? So we've got to figure out a way to do it. We can use non-human primates, but they're mm -hmm. super expensive they and are. super rare and, and really hard to do and, and come with you know, difficult ethical challenges and all sorts of other things to deal with, don't they? Exactly. Yeah, you've hit the nail on the head. So it's it's you're right. I mean, we, we we're stuck with mice for a lot of the a lot of the time, and they're not always recapitulating what we would see in terms of the PKPD in a in a human. So that's why we've been starting to work on modeling uh, what uh, are the key attributes of some of the successful traces versus ones that have failed and. That was a little bit about what I was talking about today with our sort of in silico methods. And, you know, you say the word in silico and people think, ah, oh, it never works. I mean, they really don't do a good job. And, and I have to agree. I mean, we haven't been able to rely on in silico tools. Uh, we have, you know, I, I never want to give up on things. And, and we, we, we thought, you know... Can you explain a bit what an in silico tool is? Yeah, so just using basically computer modeling and... Uh, sort of drawing upon uh, just key attributes, so physical chemical properties of um, various compounds in the chemistry realm, um, if we're talking about silico tools for chemistry. So really using computer modeling, machine learning, AI. And um, simulation. And simulation, yes, exactly. Right, to try and figure out, to try and do it without actually doing it, right? Precisely, and, yes. And... And you do that by looking at what works and what hasn't worked? Is that, is that how you do it? That's how we've, we're, we're doing it right now, and that's how people have been doing it. Uh, I think pharma has done a really great job of um, drawing upon all of their knowledge of different pharmaceutical agents that have worked and not worked. Uh, what you need in, in order to have a really great um, sort of simulation or a model is a lot of data, right? You need mm. things that have worked and not worked, and what we've found challenging is that people aren't necessarily publishing their negative data. Particularly if they're in pharma, right? Particularly. Because, yeah. Right? Because, because, <laughs> it's about the, sharing because these days, yeah. because it's so expensive to bring in hmm. a new drug, not a new pet tracer necessarily, but any kind of new drug that goes into the body, these days they make a pet version of it to test in their labs to see whether it's engaging the target before they ever take it any further, right? That's right. All the pharmaceutical companies mm -hmm. do that. But then they don't tell us. I know, and it'd be great to know, <laughs> right? It would be so helpful.
Yeah. yeah. So, so all that data sitting somewhere. <laughs> now, if you've got some data, then you should you should let Michelle know the negative great. stuff. So, yes. so that's how we improve those models, right? Right. And this is the whole thing, you know, I think, and Andre said it in his talk today, we all work together and share, you know, what we've learned and uh, throughout our various experiences, then we can hopefully move more quickly so that we can right. help patients ultimately. Because yeah. just trying and seeing is expensive. It also doesn't always work. I mean, you, look, you showed some molecules today that looked sort of kind of similar, but mm. one didn't work and, and one didn't. Yeah. We'd have to figure out why one didn't. I mean, we know it's sort of things like lipid solubility and how small mm. they are and all those kind of things. Sure. But that's only a little bit of the story. There's other things which still makes the blood-brain barrier a bit mysterious and maybe a, right. a mysterious black box of the deep learning algorithm might. <laughs> right, and that's the thing because, you know, we, you know, what, what I did was I had one of my wonderful grad students uh, put together a whole library and a catalogue of all of, this, all of this data, everything that he could find in the literature. And uh, it took a long time and it, we got a reasonable number of molecules and we ourselves immediately started to see things that, weren't captured in previous uh, sort of models. And right, you had a really big molecule that you had yeah, right. <laughs> right, and we were like, wait a minute, like we're, we're missing something here that, you know, we can add this in because this data is going to help us to model, you know, things in a more accurate way in the future. And that was just by eye. And yeah. then we started to think, wait a minute, if we use machine learning uh, and sort of tap into that whole field, and we had uh, some wonderful people helping us there from the University of Michigan, and uh, we, we sort of delved into that further ourselves. We thought, you know, there's a lot that can be done with machine learning, uh, a lot we're not seeing, uh, probably, and we're biased when we're looking, but if we use, if we can really leverage these non-biased sort of algorithms, maybe we can detect some patterns that we wouldn't have otherwise seen. And that's exactly what's happening, and you saw today, the machine learning is doing better than our manual methods at right. sort of delineating between successful and unsuccessful, and we're really being able to extract out what is the what are the key attributes that right. will... So you'll be able to test yeah. these things, and we want to test the agnostics in the brain, right? Because, That's right, yeah. <laughs> because we, we know... Uh, we know theranostics are working really well for neuroendocrine tumors. They're working great for prostate cancer. They're probably going to be working pretty good soon for um, for breast cancer, for septum uh, and so on, gastric cancer. All of these things happen, but the really tough one's brain cancer, right? Yeah. So if we can if we can work out what theranostic models are going to work for producing an imaging agent and a treatment, then that may help with in that area as well. And of course, we still haven't quite linked Alzheimer's, Parkinson's disease, TB43 um, uh, disease and so on um, mm -hmm. in, in the brain. Um, so there's still other, other challenges we've got there. And, uh, and, uh, but we've kind of got a lot of the tools. The tools are in place now. I'm feeling optimistic about what's happening. The tools are in place. We've got theranostics is working. Uh, we're starting to see a glimmer of hope in Alzheimer's working. Um, and and your tool may help us, you know, break that final key in terms of the brain. That's that's really good. Yeah, I hope so. Yeah, right. I really do. I think we're 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 making steps in the right direction. And yeah. Is there anything you'd like to add that we've missed out on that we should talk about? Or? Um, good question. I mean, I I think I just want to encourage more people to work on brain imaging because yeah. I think there's a lot of folk working on cancer, and cancer is really important. And I I think we should keep working on that. But if you're curious about the brain, and uh, we need more people working in the field. Yeah. And it's it may seem daunting, uh, but it's it's a lot of fun, and there's so much we don't know about the brain. So I think that there's it's an exciting field, and I'd just love to encourage any anyone that's thinking about starting a PhD uh, or you know just changing directions a little bit. Uh, happy to talk. Happy to start a collaboration if you have a tool that you think might be interesting for the brain, but you've never used a brain model. Uh, We'd be happy to collaborate and, and help you to learn because like, we need more people working on um, brain imaging, really. So, Absolutely, and, yeah. and you know, and brain chemistry as well. And the way yes. we understand brain chemistry is through brain imaging, right? Exactly. So we've got maybe some hopeful things, like you were saying with Alzheimer's. We've got anti tau therapies, but yeah. some of those ones they're talking about doing are injecting C into the CSF, right? Mm -hmm. Would it be much better if we can just uh, not have to do that? 
It would be. So I think that, you know, hopefully we can get some really smart chemists interested in um, tackling that problem and getting things that are small molecules that can cross more freely or other creative ways of getting things into the brain like we're talking about today. So I think there's a big wide open space there. There's a big need. And I, like you, am very hopeful. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Thank you very much. Thanks for taking part in the podcast. This has been a pleasure. You're welcome. And thank you for having me. This is wonderful. Great.